Everybody good? How's the meal? Awesome. I like that word, fabulous. Praise the Lord. As I said many times before, when you get the opportunity, go back and tell the men and women who work in the kitchen, thank you so very much for all that to do for all of us. As I said before, many of them come early and get ready to prepare the meal for you guys and for me. So thank them for what God is doing through them. Let's go before the Lord in prayer right now that the Lord will begin to move in a mighty way as I know his presence is evident in this place now. Father, we thank you, Lord. We thank you for your presence in this place, Lord God. We thank you because you have given us the ability, the privilege to raise our voices, our hands in, in glorifying and praising you, Lord God. Forgive me of all my sins, for I am a sinner, Lord God. Anoint these lips of flesh and blood to speak your holy word. Your word that is alive and powerful, that restores lives, Father, that changed our hearts, our minds, that pierces, Father. I pray, Father, that you would have your way tonight. Thank you, Lord. I give you all the glory and all the honor and all the praise. In the precious name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. The Lord uh, placed something in my heart when I was just standing back there that somebody came into this place tonight. Is that the Lord just showed me something that they were right on the very edge of making a decision for Christ. It's, it's as if the family or they know they understand who Christ is, but they have not yet had an encounter with Christ. And the Lord says, if you will allow that, he says, you'll begin to see blessings upon your life you have not even begun to imagine yet. That there's somebody right on the very edge that is there, but not allowing God to move in them for whatever reason. The Lord says, if you'll allow it, once again, you will see his blessings. Before we get started, I want to share something else with you. The Lord has been putting this in my heart for months. I shared with a couple of people, but I want to bring it to you, men, because the Lord has spoken to my spirit, said, the miracles in the house, if it can happen in the house here, especially with men, with the Lord says, I've called the men to be the priest of the household. If the miracle's not in here, it's not going to happen. And what I've been wanting to do, and many of you are builders, many of you have financial means, many of you have the ability, but this is what I wanted to do. I've been driving around many different places, and I see a lot of people. I use the word homeless, but it's not home. It's not home because they have homes in their tents. It's, I, I don't know how, what else word to use, but down and out. But there's people that are out in the streets. And my heart breaks when I see them out there. And it's not me to judge why they're there. It doesn't matter. I mean, it does matter, but it's, it's not significant to what, who Christ is and who Christ can be to them. But this is, what, this is where my heart is right now. I've been wanting to for a while, and I need your help. I'm wanting to, to build um, a, a trailer with four showers on it. Beautiful trailer. Not just, I'm not just putting something together. To, I want to build it up to code. But it'll have two women's and two men's showers with restrooms in it specifically where we can pull up at any site and they can take turns, maybe five to seven minutes each with hot and cold water with a mirror there. And we can offer them shampoos with lotion and deodorant and that type of thing where they can come in and we can have some used and new clothing there, supply the towels for them to be able to bless them so they can take a shower. Because how many know after you get off work and you, you take a shower, you feel like, oh, my God, I feel so good. You see, we take it for granted that we have the ability and the privilege to do that, and many of them don't. I, I want to do that. We want to do that. And the Lord said the miracle is in this house. So I need your help. Amen. Thank you. I, thank you. I don't have the plan, but that's why I'm calling to you guys, because many of you do have a plan. If we have to get a trailer first, big enough that, that we can begin building it, or if we can purchase one, are you ready, made, ready to go? But I want, I, want, I want it to be real. I want it to be special for them. I don't want to offer Christ junk. I want to offer Christ the best. I want it to look very nice and to bless the folks that are in need. So when they come out, they, they're homeless or whatever, they're needing a shower. We can say, I'll pull over anyway. Say, Get in line. You guys got to take a shower right now. So I need your help. The Lord said the miracle's in the house. So whether you help with your skills, your ability, or you know somebody or that has the finances, to, I don't even know what they cost. I, don't, I have no idea. Lord, just put it in my heart. says, tell the men. He says, bring it to the house where the miracle's in the house. So if any of you have any ideas or how, I'm being vulnerable to you. I don't know how yet. But I know everything we do costs money, right? So if you have the ability, you have the skill, you know how, come see me. If you want to help in one form or another, once it begins to move, we'll need help putting it out there for the people to really bless them and encourage them. Sometimes it might not be food. It might just be a hot shower, amen, that'll literally bless them with some new clothes or 
It can be in the winter. They take a hot shower. We give them some nice, even if it's used clothes, a sweatshirt with a hoodie and some gloves. Imagine how nice that feels. So help me to bless them that God gets all the glory and the Lord gets all the praise. Amen. Let's give the Lord praise right now. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. You know, tonight I want to talk about a changed mind. A changed mind because we know when, when something begins to happen in the life of a person, when you know how they lived in times past and you know uh, the things they did and all of a sudden you see them years later and they're totally different. You're like, oh my gosh, praise the Lord. You can see the tangible difference of what God has done in their life. But just the same, and that's powerful, but just the same, the same way, we know the enemy is a formidable enemy. And we know he is powerful as well. And we know that there's people that have done very well in Christ and they're doing, they're successful in their walk with Christ and ministry and everything else. Or sometimes it's not even in Christ, but they're just doing well in life. And the enemy grabs a hold of them. And they, they turn from being in a good position with family and finances and everything else to being totally the opposite. So we know it goes both ways. But in reality, it's a changed mind what happens pro or con. There's nothing more powerful in reality in Christ when there is a changed mind. You can change your clothes. You can change your car. You can change your job. Some of you can even change your spouses. But something happens in this powerful when there is a changed mind. See, you can have a deep desire in your heart to make changes. You can even have a deep, passionate desire in your heart to tell those around you that you love them and to make changes, but until you make up your mind to do so, there is nothing going to happen. You can have that passion and the desire in your heart, but until you make a decision in your mind, it's not going to happen. There has to be a changed mind. Hebrews 12, 11 through 17 reads this. Watch this. No discipline seems pleasant at the time. So some of us are going to get whooped tonight. I'm going to read it again. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. There, you can stop right there. For those that have been trained by it. Man, that's through discipline. Verse 12. Therefore, he's talking spiritually here. Watch this. Verse 12. Therefore, strengthen your feeble arms and weak knees. Make level the paths for your feet. Watch this right here. When you think he's talking about just this physically, he's talking spiritually because watch what it says here. Second half of 12. Let me read 12 again. Therefore, strengthen your feeble arms and weak knees. And 13, make level paths for your feet so that the lame may not be disabled, but rather healed. He's saying through the discipline that we allow to be trained by, we will be strengthened. For what? That in our walk with God, we're going to be strengthened spiritually, that we can begin to move in the power and the hand of God. For what? That they may be healed. So that God will begin to use you that way. Verse 14. Make every effort to live in peace with all men and to be holy. See, that's where many of us break off there. Oh, I get along with the brethren, with everybody else. Matter, matter of fact, I'm the life of the party. But we forget that part with all men and to be holy. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one misses the grace of God and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile it. Verse 16. See that no one is sexually immoral or is godless like Esau who for a single meal sold his inheritance <coughs> rights as the oldest son. Afterwards, after, as you know, when he wanted to inherit this blessing, he was rejected. He could bring about no change of mind, though he sought the blessing with tears. Once again, there's nothing more powerful in Christ that way when there is a changed mind. You ever see a... a, a, a a child in a public place that is going berserk and mom pretty much ain't doing nothing. 
with a child in reality is taking control of the whole environment there, the people around, and is running mama and everything else around her. And mama says, I'm going to give you time out. And I, I've seen that. I'm like, that boy don't need time out. I didn't say it out loud, but I was thinking it real loud. <laughs> Inside, I was thinking, that boy don't need no time out. That boy needs a good old-fashioned traditional whooping. Stay with me. I'm not, I'm not talking about abuse. Thinking that boy needs a good old, praise the Lord, whooping. Did you know that chastisement does not end with adulthood? Just because you're an adult doesn't mean you are no longer chastised. The Lord says that those whom he loveth, he chastiseth. In other words, he'll make some corrections as needed. It's more difficult to receive correction as an adult as it was when you were a child. As an adult man, we don't like to be told, all, told what to do from the get-go. But to be corrected that way, ooh, those are fighting words. <laughs> but if we do not allow chastisement or correction as adult men, as, an, as a Christian adult, I guarantee you the IRS will correct you. IRS will correct you real quick. The Fresno PD will correct you. You want to act crazy in the streets and speed up? Don't pay. I guarantee you the Fresno PD will, will correct you real fast. The DMV will correct you. Yeah, some of you know you haven't paid that child support. You don't get your, you don't get your driver's license. No making fun, but it's true. <laughs> your spouse will correct you. Yeah, you, she'll chastise you in one form or another. There are things that the people of God cannot get away with, which the world seems to always get away with, maybe temporarily. But because there is a difference, we belong to God. And God will chastise us to bring us to the position that he needs us to be in for his glory and for his honor. There are different types of chastisement. There's financial chastisement. You don't act right with your money, you're going to lose it. You will. Emotional chastisement. You get involved with a woman. If you're single or whatever, you get involved in something inappropriate. You start you get emotionally involved. You ain't acting right. You are going to get chastised. And many times we don't like that outcome. <laughs> she broke up with me and I don't know what to do. No, not, I'm not laughing at nobody, but. <laughs> Just because the Lord doesn't use a switch doesn't mean you got away with it. Yeah, just because it doesn't use a switch doesn't mean, oh, I got away with this thing. Don't mean you got away with nothing. Chastisement in the present and reality is not fun. It's not joyous. And chastisement will continue until the correction is made. That's why sometimes we're still being chastised all these years because we, we've been kicking and bucking and we haven't made that change. Correction, once again, is uncomfortable. And that, it can also be embarrassing, especially when it's done in public. Yeah. People will correct you in public. I've been corrected in public, and I didn't like it. How about the children of the child that is behaving very, very well in public? And that child is doing very, he's, he's, he, he, all three, four, five, or six of them are sitting down while she's talking to the pastor. And all of a sudden, a couple of them start acting up, and all of a sudden, they get busy, but just like kids do, and she just gives them that look. She gives them that look, but those kids already know what that look is. She ain't saying nothing, but she's looking at them. She's saying, wait till we get to the car till we get home. And those kids already know. How many of you had a mom and dad like that? Some of, some of you had parents, your mom would dad whoop you right there in public. Yeah, but you, right there in the store. <laughs> those kids know what that look means. When my dad would whoop on me back in the days a long time ago, <laughs> I definitely did not appreciate those whoopings right then and there. I didn't appreciate those whoopings at all. I did not appreciate that discipline, that correction, and those whoopings until after I started visiting a very close friend of mine that was in Corcoran Prison for life. And the way I knew him, the way he was raised, and the things he did, the mistakes he made, 
that's when I appreciated my dad's correction. I was able to look back while he, I was, I had a big old stack of quarters right there in the visitor room to give him stuff in the, in the, from the machines just to feed him while he's waiting, you know, waiting to there. And all of a sudden, I understood something. I said, Lord, thank you for my dad. Because I remember trying to do something crazy back in the day. And I, I remember, I ain't going to do that. My dad will whoop me, man, if I take that. My dad, so I, I appreciate the, the, the correction. And I understood that when I went to go visit a friend at Corcoran Prison. As adults, we don't receive correction well. We have a hard time with it. But if we receive it, look at verse 11 says, once again, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace who have been trained by it. Harvest of righteousness and peace for those that are trained by it. In John 5, we are asked, when Jesus asked the lame man, you heard me tell the story before, he has asked the lame man had been in that situation for 38 years. Would you like to be made whole? He asked him that. Now, to me, I've said that before. That sounds like a real crazy question. If you know you've been laying that way for 38 years, of course I want to be made whole. He asked him that. But that's not a crazy question because Jesus needs to hear what he wanted. See, because many people, they're feeling one thing on the inside and their expression, their body language is saying totally something else on the outside. We'll say, oh, Lord, I love you. I want to serve you. I want to be used by you. But the Lord says, okay, that's fine. As you're moving forward, I'm going to start making some corrections and some changes and some chastisement within you. Well, I don't want that. I want, I want to love you and be used by you, but I'm not talking about all the chastisement and correction stuff. We don't like that because we're so used to doing the same stuff we've been doing all our entire lives. So when God wants to make a correction, it's not comfortable. We're not used to that. Sometimes we don't even know how to make a change. But in reality, it's easy. It's very easy. Every one of us knows what's right and wrong. Every one of us knows what words we should say and shouldn't say. Everyone knows how we should treat each other and treat our loved ones especially. It's very easy that way. So in reality, there should never have to be correction or chastisement in that area. It should be evident in what we need to do. It should be very, very easy. But more as men of God because we're, we're, we're to serve everybody around us. And there, there's people around me and you every single day that are just got saved. And they need to hear and see what we do and how we live for Christ. We're the example. You've heard him say this many times. When people that are lost come to, come to Christ, they don't go to Christ like, Ugh. they come to somebody that they know knows Christ. They will come to the individual they know that it's a, a relative or a friend or a coworker that they know is a Christian, that prays, that they trust. They will come to that individual. So we need to be in a position to be used by God immediately. Will you be made whole, in other words, or are we okay living lame every single day? God needs to hear that you're saying, Lord, I want to change. I, I want to be healed. I want to be delivered. I want to stop doing what I've been doing. It might not be doing nothing crazy, but the Lord says, I'm taking you to another level. So even if it's not a real big thing, it's a small thing, but I need this change for you to move forward in the way I want you to move forward. You might think it's insignificant, but God wants us to make this change because he has to be in a position to trust us with that. Let me give you an example. Let's just say the Lord says, I want to bless you in a way that, that I'm not going to bless too many people, but I'm looking for a conduit. I'm looking for a vehicle for my finances. I'm looking for somebody to bless as a multimillionaire that I can trust with my finances. So in turn, they will bless me and bless those whom I've called them to bless. So the Lord chooses you. And the Lord says, I'm just going to make some adjustments to make sure that you're going to be okay when I bless you is to be a multimillionaire. So when you get to church Sunday, make sure you pay this much in your tithes. And we're in church thinking, that ain't God telling me that. God did not tell me to put $500 in that offering. That can't be God. The Lord says, put the money I'm just giving an example of a, a, a possible conduit. And we choose not to obey Christ, whether it's building showers for somebody or if it's giving somebody food or it's blessing somebody with the coat that you've been wearing or brand new shoes you just bought and you've been adoring them shoes. I just got these Nikes right here. And, you know, no, I'm not wearing them. Half of you guys looked at my shoes. You went like this. And the Lord says, I'm about to bless you. But first, I need to know that I can, I can trust you. 
So I need you to take those shoes off and give them to that brother that's been walking the street. You see him walking down there, and he's the guy in shoes. He's walking around in socks, and you and I need you to give him. That, that's not God, because the Lord, the Lord knows I just bought. My matter of fact, my wife bought these for me. Or she says, okay, then don't give him your shoes. Then now I know if I can't trust you with one hundred fifty dollar Nikes, I can't trust you with a million and a half dollars. Yeah. So there has to be correction. There has to be change. The Lord might say, I've called you at the church to pray for that brother when he comes, when he raises his hand. That brother was outside. I called you to pray for him, and you still didn't move. You didn't do it. And you're praying in your prayer closet saying, Lord, I desire the gift of healing to lay hands on the sick. The Lord says, when you got off your car, I told you to pray for that man. You didn't. You came right straight in. How can I trust you? With a gift like that, would you, can I not, would you pimp the gift or would you try to sell it? Pimping and selling the gift being, for $175, you can come up and I'll lay hands on you. Uh-oh. The gift and the power and the anointing of God is not for sale. Can the Lord make those changes and those corrections in us for what he wants to do tomorrow and later on today in us? We need to be in a position to be able to receive that correction or are you okay living lame sitting that way for 38 years and say no lord it's okay i got this do you want healing no lord i got this i want to stay here another 38 years i got this the lord needs to hear it the lord needs to hear it. and it's not a dumb question because he needs to he needs to know because many people in reality they like the attention that sickness gives Oh, poor thing, and how come, and why? And, and people like that attention many times. Just spiritually speaking, oh, my sugar's acting up. You quit eating them cupcakes. No disrespect. I'm just talking spiritually speaking. Hypochondriacs getting themselves sick will so get all the attention from everybody else. Some people want to be in that position. So when God asks a lame man, what would you have? The Lord knew he was lame. The Lord knew he was saved. The Lord knew something was wrong. But the Lord wanted him to say it. What do you want? Verse 14. Make every effort to live in peace with all men and to be holy. The Lord is saying we. I have to make every effort to live in peace with all those around me. All those around me. That means I have to make some minor and I have to make some major adjustments and corrections in my life. We're waiting for God to make that correction. God says, I will do that. I said it before. The Lord says, I'll make those adjustments and I'll make those corrections. But guess who's going to be the one doing it? You and I. We're the ones that actually have to say yes and no or move or don't move. We're the ones that actually have to do it. I have to correct my tongue. I'm the one that has to say or not to say or who to say it to. I'm the one that has to make those corrections. I'm the one that has to make those adjustments. I'm the one that has to make those changes. If we do not allow that correction and that chastisement, I guarantee you the Lord will make that. As I said before, it's, it's much better if you just make those changes. Once again, those things we know we got to do. Those things we got to stop doing. But we always want to stop, stop doing this, stop doing that, stop doing this, stop doing that. But there's things we got to start doing there's things we got to add on. There's things that we now have to do. We have to begin to move those ways. But he's all saying, don't just work on your relationship with me when this whole time you're being hateful to your brother. Don't be saying you love me when you can't even get along with your brothers. First John 4.20, if anyone says I love God yet hates his brother, he is a liar. Those are deep words right there. How can you say you love me and you hate your brother? For anyone who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. Back to verse 14. Make every effort to live in peace with all men and to be holy. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. In other words, being as you move forward, you have to do your best to live holy before God, to begin to see God's hand. Once again, that's not salvation. Salvation is for every God says, come as you are. Salvation is for free, and you don't earn it, and it's for come as you are. But to begin to move in God's hand in a mighty way, you got to begin to separate yourself with Christ and spend time with him to be able to develop that relationship that way for his kingdom, for his glory. 
Because we can, we can be around and we can shout for God and praise him. We can give him glory. And that's very easy in here. It's very easy in church. But I, I'm telling you, the importance of who we are in Christ is not here amongst the brick and mortar. It's out in the streets. It's everywhere else. It's all around us. It's at our job. It's on the streets at the stores where we're at. Are we proclaiming Christ? Are we allowing the Lord to use us anywhere we're at? If you choose to sit in your car while your wife is in the store shopping, why are you doing that? Are you doing it because you want to see the booty that passes by? Or are you doing that for an opportunity to see who God will allow you to minister to? Yeah. What are intentions? Why are we doing what we're doing? Hmm. That's why so many times we fail to see God's hand move in our life. And we've been serving God for years because we fail to accept the chastisement and correction that God says, I've been telling you for years to do that. I've been telling you years to make that change. And we're choosing not to do that because we fail to make that effort to live holy before God and to love our brother. Make every effort to live in peace with all men. When he's talking about all men in general, talk about all humans. So he's talking about your wife too. I'm telling you, if you got issues with your wife, you better do what you have to do to fix that. You better do what you got to do to fix that. Because you're going to have a difficult time in Christ and allowing God to use you if you're having a difficult time in your wife and you're being fake out here in public, act like you're Mr. Nice Guy and you love Jesus, you love everybody else, but you hate your spouse. Don't be talking nice to the brethren if you can't talk nice to your spouse. Yeah. Don't be loving your brothers if you can't love your wife. Yeah. If you don't feel you're in love anymore, you do what you got to do, fall in love again. Yeah. <laughs> Some of you are smiling at me real funny, but you know what you got to do. You just do what you got to do. Verse 15. See to it that no one misses the grace of God and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and to defile it. Talking about the holy relationship with God, the bitter root to grow up and to begin to defile that relationship with what God wants to do with you. Here he's talking about those things that in reality, many times people can't see. Once again, we look real good amongst the brethren. But he's talking about those things that we have, that we hold in our heart and our spirit, that way the bitterness, the envy, the jealousy, and unforgiveness. Sometimes amongst our own brethren, there's brethren that we hate in the church, people that offended us and got us mad. But yet we praise God and God says, you cannot hold that. That thing will grow and those roots will, will fester and it'll literally cause a separation in your walk with God. It'll cause you to be separated from God's presence. And many times you can't see those things. You can be standing by that family that you don't like or you have, a, you have a problem with. You can be standing by with them at church and they'll smile and say, God bless you. You'll raise your hand. You'll fist bump them or, or you'll shake their hand. You'll even give them a shoulder, a shoulder bump that way. And by the time service is over, by the time you get to the car, that root has already grown and you can feel that anger and that bitterness you have about that family or that man. God said, this thing is about to kill you and it's about to destroy you spiritually and it's going to destroy your entire family. If you allow this bitterness to continue on, God says, you better make that change and you better do whatever you have to do to get rid of that change. If you've been holding on to anger and unforgiveness for somebody that somebody's done to you years ago, you better fix that thing. I don't care what the offense is. If you think you got to be the punk to go tell that brother sorry when it was his fault, you better be the punk and go say sorry. Because you wouldn't be no punk. That takes a man to be able to do that. That's the inheritance your children will have, the integrity and the character of a godly man with a discernment. That's what your children will inherit, will they, whether they like it or not. When we allow this, this bitterness to grow, it works on the opposite of holiness. Once again, it defiles it. And that causes us to default back to the mess. Default being, if something isn't done which is right, it automatically defaults to that. It automatically goes to that automatically. When we're in the midst of our storm, when we're going through our most difficult time, our darkest hour, when, when our health, our family, things are going wrong, and, 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 and we don't do what Christ has called us to do during that time of trial or chastisement, if we don't put God first, we automatically default to what we used to do. If the pressure is too great, we will drink. If, if the pressure is different or something we're not, we can't handle this, we want to use again, or we want to use violence, or we want to do something illegal to make more money that way. 
when we're going through the most difficult times, if we don't trust in God, if we don't know how to do that, use that correction that God has given us, that chastisement, we will default back to that mess. And you will think, no, no, I, 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 I don't. And you already have. Some of you have. We default back to that mess every single time. And every time we default to that, everyone around us pays for it. Our spouse pays for it, our children, our grandchildren. And you make them walk, and we make them walk on eggshells, and they're afraid. And we think everything is cool when it's not cool. Our wife, in, in, in all the in times past, has been under our, de, our, under our default setting to take the heat every time we're uncomfortable, something's going wrong. Our children have been exposed to our default setting. And once again, it's causing destruction, not just in you, but in them. Either your troubles make you better or they make you bitter. You have to choose. If you're going to suffer, suffer well. If you're going to fall, fall forward. You have to make that decision. Because it's not about me. It's not about you anymore. It's about everybody else that God has called us to now minister to the lost. That's why I believe the Lord is telling me sometimes it might mean nothing, but it's just a shower. The Lord says, I need, you to, I need you to get a shower to these people. You see? I seen two individuals yesterday. I was, I was doing some errands for Pastor Frank, and I seen two individuals, two ladies. They were walking on the street. They came out of the freeway bushes in two different areas, one over there by California and, and sixth over there, and uh, one over here off the freeway. And I seen it two separate ladies. And if you could see through their dirt and their messed up hair, they were beautiful women. And they were half naked. And they looked like they'd been abused left and right. And I began to weep, and the Lord says, you see, when they're sleeping in the bushes or they're sleeping in the boxes, they're on their face before me and they pray. And sometimes all they say is, I just want to shower. I just want to shower. And God tells me, give them a shower. I had a lady tell me one time we went into the area over here across the chief and rescue mission before they tore that place down. And the, the abandoned buildings were there. They were like industrial warehouses all tore up. And we took a team in there, and we went in there. I've shared this before. There, and my wife was with me, and there were some other brothers and sisters. There was about, about 20 of us, but we all divided. So there was about four of us together. And we went to this one area down deep inside where it was dark. And they had, um, uh, some had flashlights, some had lighters, whatever. And, and there was one lady that was lying down in a bed, and she was covered up, and she was sick. And my heart just broke. She was sick. And she had a little kind of canister on the side where she had been throwing up. And I says, man, I began to weep before I could even talk to her. And I says, what can we do? How can we help you? Can we take you to the hospital? She goes, no. I go, do you need medication? Do you need food? How can I? She said, no. My wife asked her right there. She goes, what do you need? How can we help you right now? And she told me something that was unbelievable. She said, when she spoke to my wife, she spoke to all of us, she says, all I want is candles. I'm like, candles? She goes, I started crying. She goes, all I want is candles. I jumped in. I says, why do you want candles? She said, I'm sick because I bit an apple that the rat was eating. She says, the candles keep the rats away. I said, candles? So we brought her candles. You see, when they're in their tent and they're praying, Lord, just bring me candles. Bring me a blanket. I just want to shower, Lord. And we shower every day. And we don't listen to God's voice. So God can't move. Because the people of God can't listen. You can't hear. We need to have discernment to what God would have us to do because it's not about you and I anymore. If the Lord's going to bless those folks that are in need, he's going to do it through you. He's going to do it through us. Some of you have even financial ability to help people. Some of you have a heart to do stuff for Christ. Some of you are not afraid to go in these crazy corner dark areas you're not afraid to do that that you need to do that 
You need to begin to move, praise the Lord, brother. You need to begin to move in a way you have never moved, that God will begin to use you in a mighty way because every time those people are praying, God says, I'm going to answer your prayer. Pastor Rudy, I need you to talk to the brothers about making some showers. So I don't know how. The Lord says, tell the brothers. The miracle's in the house. You see, when you're able to be willing to receive correction, that means you have changed your mind. That means you have changed your mind. When you're willing to make critical adjustments, that means you have changed your mind. Thank you, gentlemen. That means you have changed your mind. You brothers that, that are living for God and that foul Jezebel spirit presents something to you, it will not matter because you have changed your mind. It will no longer be significant because you have changed your mind. You sisters that are watching online will no longer take the abuse from the spouse or from anybody else because you have changed your mind. It won't matter if the people who think you do that stuff in front of you because you have changed your mind. There's something powerful that happens when a man changes his mind. Proverbs 29.1 says this, a man who remains, thank you, my brother, a man who remains stiff-necked after many rebukes will suddenly be destroyed without remedy. I need to read that again. Thank you. Thank you. A man who remains stiff-necked after many rebukes will suddenly be destroyed without remedy. How long have we been stiff-necked and ignored God's will in our life because we still struggle with our stuff? We need to be able to take, and I'll repeat it again, to take that correction and that chastisement to begin to move forward. Thank you, my brothers, for what God has called us to do. And I'll say this in closing. Every time chastisement is implemented, it is to get you to change your mind. It is there to help you to change your default. Thank you that you will no longer default to the exact same mess that we've been defaulting to all these years. That when this, when this trigger, this one specific button is pushed inside of you, that one button that is pushed inside of you and that when that one button is pushed, it's like no other. It will no longer cause you to default as the past because you have changed your mind. The Lord says, tell this to the brothers in a form of a warning. He says, because I'm about to allow them to see some things that they're going to have to change. And that's going to be the determination in reality what I'm going to do through them. If the Lord is going to trust us with people, he means trust you with people and i said it before can god trust you with a beautiful woman that is half naked standing in front of you can god trust you with the woman that is half naked in front of you on the streets can he trust you to minister to her without you having any malintent without you having any misconceptions without judging her can god trust you to minister to that woman I told my wife I didn't know what to do. I said, I don't know what to do. When I see them like that, it's like it's coming alive. Like it's never come alive before. God says, you cannot be too consumed with your life. He says, because those souls are dying every single day, and your name is written in the last book of life, and you're okay. But because it's not about you anymore, are you willing to allow, thank you, gentlemen, the Lord to use you 
the way the Lord needs to move. The Lord is moving in a mighty way, and he's looking for a conduit. He's looking for a vehicle to begin to move supernaturally. But he can't until you're willing. Throughout all Scripture, Peter's the only other one besides Jesus that walked on water. He's the only one. Even the other disciples didn't walk on water. Peter just said, I'm going to do it. I've never walked on water. I've never seen anybody else walk on water. Jesus would do it, but I don't know if anybody else would have done that. Why should I think I can do that? He says, come out. Just do it. He says, and watch. You begin to see miracles you've never seen in your entire life. And watch what God will do. There's, God's about to use many of you in a mighty way. If not you, then who? Why not you? Why not me? We're always thinking, God's going to use somebody else. God says, I've chosen you. Why not? When they let us back in these hospitals, we as men should be in those hospitals praying for people. Yeah, I've told you before, you need to be in the waiting room praying for the folk. You need to be on the streets praying for people. Do not let that COVID put you. You need to be careful. I agree. You need to be very careful because this, this disease is real. But you need to do what Christ has called you to do. Amen. But I'll tell you this in closing. It has to start in your home. Don't be telling the brothers you love them if you can't tell your wife you love them. Don't be telling the brothers you love them. And don't be telling the brothers you love their children and you want to minister to their kids when you don't minister to your own. You've got no right to be ministering to another brother's wife if you can't even minister to your own wife. I'm not saying she's perfect. My wife ain't perfect. But I still minister to my wife. Get ready, brothers. You guys got to begin to see a world with what God's about to do. Get ready. Get ready to see the hand of God. If you'll allow him, If you'll allow him, the Lord says, do not fear their faces. Just move. Just move. And watch what God will do.